The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, presented the idea of creating an indivisible security system in Russia on the third day of the meeting with the other BRICS members. Russian President Vladimir Putin met with his Venezuelan counterpart Nicolás Maduro to seal the strategic alliances on the sidelines of the 2024 BRICS summit. And Israel carries out a wave of airstrikes against a Hezbollah stronghold in southern Beirut, Lebanon, on the night of October 23rd, destroying a residential complex. Hello and welcome to From the South. I'm Alejandra Garcia from Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, presented the idea of creating an indivisible security system in Russia on the third day of the meeting with the other BRICS members. The Russian head of state highlighted that this system should be built on an inclusive and non-discriminatory basis. Putin argued that it is about ensuring security, common effort, stability and setting out conditions for the breakthrough of all states and peoples in Russia. The leader further stressed that Russia, as other BRIC members, is open to working in conjunction with the countries of the Global South and East to boost inclusive and sustainable development in order to build up a better world. Likewise, the Russian president prized the capacity and strength of the BRICS members and partners countries to lead the world to be part of an equal global security system and to contribute to the global development. I would like to note that the states represented here have great opportunities, resources, capabilities and global authority for ensuring world security and for sustainable development. Many of our countries come up with their own useful initiatives, so does Russia. Russia comes up with idea of forming an equal and indivisible security system in Euroasia. The idea is to ensure stability truly, and to set out conditions for peaceful development of all regional countries, and it is symbolic that. Our today's session takes place on a day when we celebrate the United Nations, as on October 24, 1945 the United Nations Charter came into force. The 16th summit is coming to an end, and in this context, let's listen to all the highlights of this multilateral event with a special envoy, Juno Sooner. Good afternoon from the city of Kazan in the Russian Federation, where the Russian President Vladimir Putin just minutes ago finished his final press conference, kind of officially closing the summit. He is still maintaining, as the other leaders also do, some bilateral reunions, but this was on behalf of the BRICS, the last official statement, and he made, he provided inform, important informations, the Russian president. He summarized the Russian activities during the uh, BRICS presidency and emphasized that it continues until the 1st of January with further events taking place within the BRICS con context. He said 200 events, conferences, the business forum have taken place during the year. He uh, mentioned the uh, BRICS sports event, BRICS women's events, and he said that these are continuing until the end of year. He said 35 states and six international organizations participated in this summit, where, according to the Russian president, truly independent and sovereign states uh, have gathered together that have chosen to choose their own path. Uh, he summarized the activities of the uh, conference uh, within the three chapters, politics, security, trade, investment and cultural activities and connections. And he said that uh, he and then he came to speak about the BRICS plus uh, uh, platform, which revived future cooperation with its members. And he set the goal again to establish, a, I quote, a more democratic, inclusive and multipolar world. He emphasized that interbank communication settlement agreements new development activities will continue and he provided the news that dilma rousseff 
will continue as chairwoman of the new development bank, despite the fact that Brazil takes over the presidency uh, next year of BRICS. So the uh, president of the new NDB and uh, the per pro tempore the president of the NDB will both be uh, Brazilians. But he said everybody knows that we are under Western pressure, so we don't want to lay our burdens on the bank. So the Dilma Rousseff's time has been expanded. Very important statements came from uh, the Russian president regarding the BRICS expansion. He mentioned again that the BRICS countries have established a new category, the partner country category, uh, emphasizing that BRICS is open uh, for everyone. And then he explained that during the summit, the delegations have held meetings with each other to come to a consensus about whom to invite to this partner country status. There is a certain consensus about certain countries, which the Russian president did not reveal, but uh, he said there is a uh, consensus, and he said these countries will now uh, receive an invitation by BRICS, and if they respond positively, then they will be invited to officially get the partner country status. And then in the questions and answers fraction, uh, part, the, uh, he was asked whether Brazil was vetoing uh, Venezuela's application for BRICS membership. And the uh, Russian president said uh, that he had a talk with the Brazilian uh, president the day before yesterday and that they clearly have different positions regarding the Venezuelan elections. Putin emphasized that there are electoral laws in Venezuela, that Venezuela has complied with these, and that the actual president, Nicolas Maduro, has won the elections. And he expressed his hope that uh, in their bilateral relations uh, between Venezuela and Brazil, they will overcome these uh, problems. And he expressed that he has confident in that Lula whom he called an honest and integral person, will treat the matter objectively. So he indicated that this problem might be overcome and also shared the news that the Brazilian president had delivered him a message to be delivered to the Venezuelan president. So there is, regarding the expansion of uh, BRICS, we have to state the following. There is a list that the existing members have a consensus upon. This is necessary. It is not by majority rule, but by consensus. And then uh, there are other cases where they don't have yet a, major, uh, a consensus. And there, the dialogue and the uh, communication is still ongoing. Thank you, Yunus, for our, the coverage of this event and all the information. We were listening to our special envoy, Yunus Sooner, during this third and final day of the BRICS Summit 2024. And with this report, report from our colleague, let's take a short break. But remember, you can join us on TikTok at Telesphere English. There you'll, be, you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and more. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. To go deep into the relevance of the 16th summit of the BRICS 2024 from Ecuador, we invite political analyst Eduardo Meneses. Hi, Eduardo. Thank you for your time here in From the South. Thank you for the invitation. The BRICS summit comes to an end after three days of intense debates. Can we say that this event will mark a before and an after in the world's political order as a counterweight, or we could, uh, we could say as a counterweight of hegemonic powers? Well, I, I do believe that um, this, this forum is specifically suited for answering the challenges that we are living right now as a historic moment a historic moment in terms of the war scenario that is being structured all, uh, in our planet in different conflicts, Ukraine and Russia, 
the genocide in Palestine, all the tensions that the U.S. are financing against China through Taiwan. So definitely, I think that in the middle of this growing tension between the U.S. and the emerging multipolar world, this forum has had a very specific and important role, which is confirming its proposal to a restructuring of for a restructuring for the global governance. So in that sense, it is very important. There are still many things to be built, but the dynamic that this forum is taking in this historical moment is is key for the next decade. Meeting, the meeting took place amid an uncertain international scenario marked by the Israeli genocide against the people of Palestine and as well as the increased aggressions against Lebanon and Syria. How the summit has been a space to voice the suffering of the peoples of the Middle East? So I think that we could see three main things here. The first one is when we observe how the BRICS are expanding to new members. We definitely see Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Ethiopia. And this is an expansion which is very different from the traditional uh, Western-led governance, which is including G7, G8 groups from a, they, they are trying to have an hegemonic perspective from the Western perspective led by the US. So that's a first point where Definitely, the Middle East uh, countries are more and more uh, involved and more and more taking account in this new multipolar order that is emerging, which is not something that someone decides. It is a reality from the economic, geopolitical facts. There's a second very important uh, point, which was highlighted in the, the declaration of this summit, uh, which was the, the total support for the inclusion of Palestine as a complete UN member. So this, uh, again, this has been a, a position that has been already def been defended by all the countries in the BRICS, but having this regional support perspective as a whole uh, new perspective of multilateralism is essential to support the Palestinian right to have a, a state which is recognized, which, which deserves to live in peace, which uh, has to be uh, respected and not being uh, occupied by military forces and even worse being a victim of genocide. But the third one, and I think that that would be maybe the most important point in terms of long-term perspective, is the ask the concrete uh, support for a reform of the UN Security Council. We have been seeing that in many forums, but we have now BRICS officially in its declaration claiming the need uh, for a new uh, architecture of the UN and specifically the Security Council, where we should have a Security Council which is more in inclusive of uh, new members, uh, being emerging economies but also developing countries, reducing the veto power that has only the five permanent members of the of the Security Council, the Council and also much more transparency and accountability of what opposition taking there. So all of that makes a very clear signal. Uh, towards uh, the necessity of thinking how Palestine cannot become or cannot open a new era of uh, of brutality, uh, of violation of human rights without anything happening, right? So this is a very important message. Right. Eduardo, Israel's policy of blockading Gaza has resulted in hunger and dire health conditions for the population. Also, the U.S. blockade against Cuba similarly has resulted in difficult conditions for ordinary Cubans. So how do you see blockades and sanctions as a foreign policy tool when this affects mainly the population of a country? Well, this is, in fact, this was also a very important point discussed in the, in the BRICS summit, right? The, there was this uh, clear uh, denounce made about how these unilateral sanctions are being used as an imperialist tool by the U.S. and their, some of the European allies uh, against countries that do not align with their geopolitical goals. Um, in fact, if we see a little bit under the lines, the, the European Commission, very shortly after the release of the declaration of the summit, of the BRICS summit, they stated that they were not agreeing with some of the things that were said there, there because clearly this summit expressed the, the total 
uh, uh, illegal decisions that have been taken and sanctions that have been taken by the, the European Commission, by the US, against Iran, for example, against Russia, for example, when they are saying that they are taking these for, uh, um, because they are viol there are violations of human rights, there are violations of dem democratic rights, but at the same time, they are saying anything against Israel. So that was a very important topic that was treated in the Brics. I do believe that it's time now that, and, and that we can see totally how these sanctions have been evolving in the last two decades and are being used totally as a financial financial weapon. It is not uh, neither the US, neither the European Commission or the European Parliament are taking uh, account of human rights or democratic rights. This is those all of those has been mere excuse excuses for in fact taking a financial war against uh, the countries that are not answering to their ge geopolitical goals. This is very clear in the in the case of uh, Cuba, as you mentioned, the case of Venezuela. And in fact, what we do need is actual democratic decisions in the UN when we can take uh, military embargo for example, as a continuation of the decision that was has been the decision that has been both voted in the UN uh, General Assembly or even in the UN uh, Security Council uh, by the by the Council of the International Court of Justice, for example, we have had one year of many international decisions that have been uh, rooted on human rights against uh, what Israel is doing as a genocide. Palestine and nothing has happened. So this clearly reveals how this has been merely uh, the, all these sanctions are being used by the US and European countries as a, war, a part of their financial war for the ones who are not answered to their interests. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, very much for your time here in From the South. From very Ecuador, much for, from... No, you're welcome. From Ecuador, we listen to political analyst Eduardo Meneses in the context of the 16th BRICS held in the Russian city of Kazan. And with this interview, we have a second short break coming up. But before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to rewatch the interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back. Israel carries out a wave of airstrikes against the Hezbollah stronghold in southern Beirut, Lebanon, on the night of October 23rd, destroying a residential complex. The raids came after the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, on visit to Israel, told, told it's a lie to avoid further escalation with Iran. Israel is fighting Iran's backed Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon and has vowed to retaliate against Iran for the, an October 1st missile attack. In Lebanon, the official national news agency reported at least 10 Israeli strikes on Beirut's southern suburbs after the Israeli army issued an evacuation warning for the area. Moreover, four Israeli strikes hit a residential complex near the southern suburb of Lailaki, completely destroying it and causing a large fire. The Lebanese resistance has been lacking from the assassination of Hashem Safi al-Din after an aggressive criminal incursion of the Israeli army. Hezbollah announced on Wednesday the death of the chairman of its executive council in a Zionist aggression. Following the announcement, the Lebanese resistance expressed its commitment to the martyrs of to continue the path of resistance and struggle until achieving the goals of freedom and victory. For many years, Sayed Hashem Safi al-Din headed the executive council and its different institutions and units. He worked in multiple fields related to the task of the resistance. Furthermore, for a long time, Safi al-Din devoted his life to Hezbollah and was close to the resistance fighters and loved the families of its martyrs.
The operations room of the Lebanese resistance Hezbollah published a fi filed briefing out the battles fought by its soldiers against the Israeli army this October 23rd on the border with occupied Palestine. The report confirmed the losses inflicted on the enemy in terms of equipment and numerous officers and soldiers along the five axes of confrontations of the front line until reaching their position deep in occupied Palestine. According to the briefing, the casualties counted in the actions exceeded 70 dead and 600 wounded officers and soldiers in addition to the destruction of 28 Merkeva tanks and four military bulldozers, one armored vehicle and one troop, troop transport for Herm's drones were also taken down. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, called for a prompt and thorough investigation into an attack by the Israeli army near a hospital in South Beirut. In his statement issued on October 22nd, he recalled how hospitals, ambulances and medical personnel are protected by international humanitarian law because of their critical role in saving lives. Turk stressed the need for all involved parts to assess the impact of military operations near hospitals and urge them to comply with the principles of proportionality and precaution. He also called for all feasible measures to be taken to avoid or at least minimize incidental loss of civilian lives during what he referred to as military actions. In the last two weeks of military attacks, Israel massacred more than 770 Palestinians on the Habalia refugee camp in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. In a statement released this October 23rd, Gaza's government media office said that over 1,000 Palestinians have also been injured. More than 100,000 wounded and sick people in the northern parts of Gaza are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, which remains elusive due to the Israeli military's destruction of four hospitals in the area. Havalia has been on the focus of Israeli operations for 19 days. The United Nations said that no trucks of food, water or medicine have entered the northern Gaza Strip since September 30. The United Nations called on October 23rd for the respect of international humanitarian law in Gaza as it warned of harrowing levels of death, injury and destruction, as well as obstacles to its anti-polio vaccination campaign. The Israeli offensive is keeping that part of the region inaccessible to humanitarian aid, while civilians are trapped under the rubble. The United Nations Secretary General's deputy spokesman Farhan Haq said the sick and wounded lack vital health care, families lack food, and their homes have been destroyed. In addition, he said that the interruption of the flow of supplies forced the postponement of the polio vaccination campaign due to the escalating violence and heavy shelling. We have come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net and join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok as well. For Telesur English, I'm Alejandra Garcia. Thank you for watching.